Hello, I am Dr. Carolyn Eaton. This week in medicine, I am talking about vitamin D. I chose vitamin D as the second of my vitamin series because how common insufficiency and deficiencies are and the medical impact that those deficiencies have. So what is vitamin D initially? Well, vitamin D isn't a vitamin in our traditional sense. It's not a vital amine. It is actually a secosteroid, uh, something that our body makes when exposed to sunlight through the skin. And the UV light breaks down something called 7-dehydrocholesterol and creates vitamin D. And that vitamin D, in turn, is what helps the body absorb calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium through the small intestines. And without vitamin D, very bad things happen. First off, in childhood, if people are vitamin D deficient, they get develop a bone condition called rickets. Now, rickets causes very weak bones. The bones don't form properly in the first place. There's a lot of bowing uh, when they try to stand and walk. And this is a very serious problem 100 years ago, uh, especially in the northern parts of Europe and in Scotland and northern part of UK which is where some of the first studies were done on rickets. And even once we discovered what it was, what vitamin D was and how to supplement it, how to make it, the more mild deficiencies are still very prevalent. And we find that even mild deficiencies in vitamin D contribute to not just osteoporosis, but heart disease, strokes, several types of cancer, that it causes problems during pregnancy for many women, including an increased risk of something called preeclampsia, as well as gestational diabetes, and can affect uh, fetal growth rate. So making sure pregnant women have supplementation is important. And we, it's fairly easy to supplement, but even when we supplement vitamin D, Sometimes we don't see that immediate effect or improvement in those, in those other conditions besides the rickets and osteomalacia. Now, vitamin D is also extremely important in the regulation of something called your parathyroid gland. Your parathyroid gland is what regulates your calcium that goes in your bloodstream. So if you don't have enough vitamin D and you can't absorb calcium properly through your stomach, then your body starts to increase something called parathyroid hormone, which in turn causes your calcium to leave your bones and go into your bloodstream. This in turn is what contributes to osteoporosis and the most severe conditions, osteomalacia. So, that, so it's extremely important for that. Now, other things we found vitamin D to be important for is it also is extremely important in helping your body regulate the inflammatory markers from the immune system so that when there's an acute infection, the inflammation markers I talked about in the viral response, the immune response, the inflammatory markers go up. But as that infection goes on, the immune system then starts to tamp down those inflammatory markers and brings them back down. And vitamin D is essential in that process. And they feel that's one of the reasons that vitamin D deficiency may contribute to worse outcomes from especially viral type infections, which we have seen with COVID-19. People with lower levels of vitamin D at the onset of the infection or upon hospitalization tend to have worse outcomes from COVID-19. So that's a more immediate one. Now, when it comes to these diseases being caused by vitamin or being contributed to by vitamin D deficiency, the response is simply, let's all take a bunch of vitamin D. And we've tried that. And unfortunately, it doesn't really help a whole lot except for in pregnant women. We have found that in pregnant women who have low vitamin D levels at the onset of the pregnancy, making sure we supplement their vitamin D, they tend to see lower rates of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and have better fetal growth and so are less likely to have uh, low birth weight babies. So they're one of the few ones we've actually been able to show definitely give the vitamin D and there's this immediate improvement in outcomes. Unfortunately, the other things not so much. Even with the uh, osteoporosis studies, they have found people who take vitamin D routinely 
for 10 or more years may see a reduction in development of osteoporosis or slowing of the development of osteoporosis, but it's still a very, it does not quite reach, reach what we call statistical significance. So it's like, yeah, it probably helps, but we can't really prove that it does. And unfortunately, in all the other studies we've shown and where people supplement vitamin D for several years, it has not been shown to decrease uh, heart attacks, strokes, cancers, uh, improve out outcomes of cancers. But we do know that the deficiency is seen in people with those underlying conditions. And people with low vitamin D levels at the onset of their cancer or on, at diagnosis of cancer tend to have worse outcomes from their cancer. And so it's one of those issues where we're not exactly sure if it's the vitamin D itself or if it's some kind of cascade that's downstream from the vitamin D that the vitamin D has either caught, the lack of vitamin D has caused to happen or, or vitamin D keeps something from happening. So that's really where a lot of the research is right now. And it may simply be that you need to work to make sure that you don't become vitamin D deficient in the first place. And that's really what this next part of the talk is about, is maintaining your vitamin D levels. So how do we make vitamin D? As I said at the start, exposing your skin to sunlight is the main way to make vitamin D. You're, you go out in sunlight and your skin starts to break down 7-dehydroxycholesterol and it creates vitamin D3 and that's the active form and your body is able to then utilize the vitamin D to do all the things it needs to do. And in Caucasians, that's about 10 to 15 minutes of direct midday sunlight. And if you're like me and sensitive to the sun, you're not really big on going out in the sun for more than a few minutes at a time, especially in the middle of the day like that. I tend to burn very quickly. And so for me, it's a problem. And it takes longer, the darker your skin is, the more sunlight exposure you need. So you need to find that balance of enough sunlight to make vitamin D, but not so much to uh, become, increase your risk of having skin cancer. So, so, so you're like me, you really don't go out in the sun a whole lot, how much supplemental vitamin D do you need? Typically speaking, adults should take anywhere between 600 units and 4,000 units of vitamin D per day. Now that's how the United States refers to it in units. Most of Europe refers to it in micrograms and that would be uh, 15 to 100 micrograms per day. So on the low end of things, if you get some sunlight most of the time, you're a fairly active person, um, you get out and walk or jog, you get out in the sun a few times a week, probably on the lower end is really all you need to take. And in foods, if you wanna to try to get it in foods, not a whole lot of foods have it. And that's why it's almost always supplemented. It's added into milk about uh, 40, it's 400 units per quart of milk, uh, regular dairy milk and 800 units per non-dairy milk. So it's like soy milks and oat milks and all those other things. Um, naturally occurring, it does occur in fatty fish. And so you'll get about 40 units per ounce of in fatty fish. And in about, and also and interestingly enough, irradiated mushrooms, so mushrooms that have expo been exposed to sunlight have small amounts of vitamin D. Egg yolks have some vitamin D, but not a lot of foods uh, have vitamin D. Your body really needs to make it or you need to take it in, in a fortified form through milk and cereal and all of that. Which is of course one of the reasons we oftentimes are vitamin D uh, deficient and insufficient around the world. People who really need to make sure they're getting vitamin D and probably even a little bit more vitamin D, more in that about 1,000 to 2,000 units a day level, are people who are uh, in northern climates, places that they don't get very much sun most of the year, especially in the wintertime, making sure they're supplementing additional vitamin D. It is a fat-soluble vitamin, so your body does store some of it, but you want to make sure you're getting, in it, getting it in routinely. Also, anybody who belongs to a religious group where you cover yourself, uh, your skin almost entirely, you'd want to make sure you're taking additional vitamin D. And people who are darker skinned, especially both darker skinned and living in a northern climate, you really want to make sure you're getting vitamin D supplementation because you're simply not, not going to be able to make it very easily in your environment. So also people who are nighttime workers, there's a lot of, lot of people who need to take supplements. People who are nighttime workers who don't get uh, much sunlight during the day because they're sleeping during the day, so they only get morning light and evening light. 
and people who are obese because vitamin D is fat soluble and it will uh, store into your fat stores in your body and so less is bioavailable and in your bloodstream. So people who are in that group. Now people who need to watch the vitamin D supplementation and really always talk to your doctor before taking any supplements, but people in these categories really need to talk to their doctor before, definitely before taking a supplement. Anyone who has kidney disease, especially if you're on dialysis, um, because your vitamin D regulation and that parathyroid hormone regulation are really important in that group. Also anybody who is having um, any kind of parathyroid surgery, you've had thyroid surgery, they may have also affected the parathyroid gland, you wanna talk about vitamin D supplementation. Mainly because in these people, if you get too much vitamin D, it can increase the absorption of calcium to the point where calcium levels can become toxic. The vitamin D itself, it's hard to become toxic on, it's technically possible, but it's those secondary uh, electrolytes that can become toxic if you get too much vitamin D. So, and those people, as I said, with renal disease, um, people with parathyroid disease, people with um, who just also uh, issues with the functioning of the liver, cirrhosis, also may need to discuss vitamin D supplementation with their physicians. Most, in most cases, you need to be on vitamin D, but not all cases. Anybody who's had a condition where their calcium levels are too high also needs to watch it. Now, men should also watch taking too much cal vitamin D because if you get too much calcium, which I said vitamin D absorbs calcium, um, helps you absorb calcium. If you get too much calcium, that actually can increase atherosclerosis, which is calcifications along the larger blood vessels and the aorta and the coronary vessels, which can increase the risk of heart attacks and strokes. So you've gotta be watching it there too. So you need a little bit, not too much. It's like almost everything in this world. We need to have a little bit, you need to have just the right amount. You need to be in that Goldilocks zone. So what other ways uh, can you get it? As I said, those are the main ones. And how much should be in your bloodstream? In the US, we measure it by nanograms per milliliter. In the US, we say about 30 to 50 nanograms per milliliter should be the effect, uh, appropriate levels in the bloodstream. In the UK and most of the rest of the world, they refer to it in nanomoles per liter and in that case, it's about 75 to 100 nanomoles per liter is the expected uh, levels in the bloodstream. So in, in talking to your physician, and you might want to check and see about having your vitamin D level checked, it, it, just as a baseline. You don't need to monitor and follow your vitamin D level after that, but getting an idea of where your baseline is is a good idea. So talk to your doctor about that. So, all right. So the next little bit I'm going to talk about is the history. And again, for those who are not that interested in how they found vitamin D and the history of vitamin D, you're done for the day. I t said I was going to do a talk today on uh, different studies and what they mean and how that revert refers to COVID-19 and why there's still a lot of questions about hydroxychloroquine. Well, the other doctor did a great job on that and I'm just going to put the link for that. So I really felt there was no need to reinvent the wheel. So I'm just going to put that on there. And then um, next week, I haven't quite decided on my topic next week. Um, I'm probably gonna talk about heart disease. So stay tuned on that one. And until then, have a great week and stay healthy, stay safe, make sure you eat your fruits and vegetables and get out and get some exercise. Now the history of vitamin D is pretty interesting. What happened was back in the turn of the, the, the 20th century, so early 1900s, they were discovering all these diseases that were really associated with food deficiencies and nutritional deficiencies. And they started wondering if this condition called rickets that they saw very frequently in children in the northern por portion of the UK, including Scotland, if it was being caused by something, one of these nutritional deficiencies that they had not identified yet. And so a Dr. Mellonby, Sir Edward Mellonby technically, took a bunch of puppies and he fed them what he considered the Scots diet, which was oats and mutton. And he shut these little puppies up away inside and they developed rickets. And so he's like, oh, okay, something in their diet. And he'd seen um, studies by a Dr. McCollum from the United States where cod liver oil contained, that they identified vitamin A through, had cured night blindness. And so he took the cod liver oil and he gave it to the puppies and they cured the rickets. So he's like, oh, wow, 
well, I guess rickets is caused by a vitamin A deficiency, and we just need to give all these kids cod liver oil. Well, Dr. McCullum was like, you know, the people with night blindness didn't have rickets, and the kids with rickets don't have night blindness. So he thought it was something else. And so when he found out about, about uh, Sir Mellon B's research, he goes, nope, it's something else in the cod liver oil. So he was able to go in and basically remove the vitamin A from the cod liver oil and did the same experiment with the puppies, gave them the di same diet, had them shut away without sunlight, and gave them the cod liver oil, and they still got better. So he's like, okay, it's something else. And finally, in the mid-1930s, they were able to identify vitamin D. So, and yes, it's very, cod liver oil is probably one of the best sources of vitamin D we can find nutritionally. And now that they could identify it and they could create it, they could supplement it into other foods and help prevent rickets. Well, in the meantime, they've been giving the cod liver oil to the kids up in Northern UK, which if you have a Scottish grandmother or a great grandmother, she may have tried to give you cod liver oil for a long time. That's why, is because it really did prevent rickets because it had vitamin D. So it's one of those ones that they were able to find this out, I said, in the, 19, in the 1930s, but they really didn't find out other things about vitamin D and how it affected the immune system really until the 1970s. And exactly how it kept the, how it prevented rickets was something they started to finding out actually even before they were completely able to identify the substance, but they found that those that were given the cod liver oil could better absorb their calcium and magnesium and phosphorus. And they'd already found that in sheep, if they were shut away indoors and not allowed to be outside in the light, their calcium levels dropped. And so there's a lot of those things were able to go on all at the same time. So that is the brief history of vitamin D and how they're able to find it and why you said if you have a Scottish grandmother, she wants you to take, she wanted you to take cod liver oil. I will see you again next week. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy.